my crown that pierced your hands and your brow. Those were my thorns, those were my scorns, those were my tears that fell down. And just as you said it would be, you did all. Turn to Luke's Gospel, Luke 23. Thank you again for the beautiful music. And let's turn to Luke 23. We're going to read beginning in verse 33 uh, as we preach this morning simply on the cross of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. And if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke 23, we're going to read verses 33 through 43 as we prepare for this week of worshiping and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 23, verse number 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors on the right hand and the other on the left then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, 
and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which was hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so grateful today that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son. And this morning, as we consider the sacrifice of that gift, I pray that you would cause us to regain focus, to regain an understanding of really what it means to be a Christian. And Father, that we would move forward from this service a different people having looked at the cross is my prayer. And especially if there is someone here that does not know Jesus as a personal Savior, that today would be the day when they personally choose to receive Christ. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Throughout our lives, we experience many different trials, many different seasons of life. Many times, as we have been through this past 12 months, we have been told to focus on this policy or this work procedure or perhaps uh, some other need relative to our own health or relative to our own plans. And yet, in many ways, Christians across America have lost focus this year on the single most important one that we should be focusing upon. And that one is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not wrong to be concerned about your health. Our body is the temple of the Lord. Uh, these are things to be concerned about. And we certainly are doing our best to be careful but not fearful at Lancaster Baptist Church. It's not wrong to consider your finances. The Bible teaches us to be stewards and to be generous and to be uh, careful in the way we manage these things. Uh, it's not wrong to focus on family needs and uh, to focus on the needs of your home. But may I say to you this morning that the greatest object of our focus and worship should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Some come to church and focus on who's there and who's not there and who's wearing this and who's wearing that. And some focus on how they perceive others should behave, and some are experts at watching others. But may I say to you that the greatest single focus in your life and mine should not be on ourselves, on our culture, on others. It should be on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's what we want to do this week. You see, a glimpse at the cross can change everything. The Bible speaks in the book of Corinthians about many who had come to know Christ as Savior, and as it spoke of their transformational experience, it says all of the list of sins that they had been involved in, their fornication, their adultery, their lasciviousness, uh, their effeminate lifestyle, and then the Bible says, such were some of you. In other words, when they came to the cross, everything changed because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm thankful today for the power of the cross. In our text this morning, we see just before the crucifixion, this time known as the triumphal entry, 
the time when the Lord Jesus rides triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9 and verse 9, where the Bible says, Rejoicing greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Here we see that is being fulfilled as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. The people greeting him with the cry, Hosanna, Hosanna. Psalm 118 and 25 says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And this is what they said. Blessed is the one that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Christ was welcomed as the resurrection week began. Thursday was the time of preparation. The Passover taking place in the evening, celebrated on Thursday evening in the upper room. The Last Supper, which we will study tonight in our service, uh, was then followed by the upper room discourse. And, and Jesus and his disciples then leave to a place called uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's interesting to think about these gardens Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane because of what had taken place many years prior in the Garden of Eden. Because man chose to sin, Jesus is now on his way to the cross of Calvary. And it was there in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus, as he was praying to the Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, not just the physical pain, but the bearing of your sin and mine in his body. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then as he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Shortly thereafter, we know the story. John 18 tells us that Jesus was betrayed by one of his own. Don't be discouraged when someone you thought was a super Christian suddenly is nowhere to be found. Suddenly is speaking things you never thought they would speak. Even one of the 12 closest followers of Jesus betrayed him. For a few pieces of silver, Jesus is betrayed in that garden of Gethsemane and brought before the Jewish leaders at Caiaphas' house. Many of you have studied this story, and I remember standing there on the steps of Caiaphas' house and looking back to the old city and realizing that short distance from which Jesus came and through which he walked. And as you think of the walk of Jesus to Caiaphas' house, every step he knew he was getting one step closer to the cross of Calvary. Of course, you'll recall Pilate. He was a political man. He didn't want to get caught up in this. He said, I find no fault in him. And truly there is no fault in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the crowd grew angrier and angrier. And some of you will recall, they began to scream, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. They would rather set free a common criminal than let Jesus Christ escape the pain of the cross. And so now as we come to our text, about nine in the morning, Jesus is brought to the place of crucifixion just outside the city. He's already been through a time of judgment, a time of scourging. The Bible tells us there is a man, Simon the Cyrenian, that is carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. We know from studying history and the scriptures that Simon was a black man. May I say to you uh, that when you love the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no racism or discrimination in your heart. And here's Simon the Cyrenian carrying the cross after Jesus had been scourged and beaten. Here we see this picture of the cross of Calvary. Suddenly, Christ is coming face to face with this Roman object of punishment and execution. And so it is that we sing today about the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Years I spent in vanity and pride, and then we come to Calvary. And, and today, people wear the cross around their neck and sometimes uh, uh, place it in their home as a piece of art, perhaps. But not during these days. 
No one wanted to be around a cross. No one wanted a cross in their home. No one thought of the cross as a sense of pride or even redemption. Only pain and suffering. Would you come with me this morning to the place of the cross? The Bible says in verse 33, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary. May I remind you that this place, like your place and mine, was a prepared place. This, this place was a created place. Jesus Christ himself had created the place. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible tells us of this place, that it is a place called Calvary. Uh, from uh, the Greek, a cranion uh, to the Latin Calvaria. The word cranion, you might guess it, means a skull. It is referred to as the place of the skull, Calvary, sometimes referred to as Golgotha. And when you visit the place, still to this day, you can see uh, even the forming of what may look like a human skull. And Jesus Christ is brought to the place of Golgotha, the place of the skull. And here, in this place, the Lord Jesus will voluntarily give his life for our sin. I find it amazing to contemplate that Jesus created the place where he would die. That Jesus created the tree upon which he would hang. It was a prepared place. There was a purpose for that place. God is a God of a purpose and plan. And he tells us in Galatians 4 and 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? That all of this was according to his timetable. Has it ever occurred to you that these last 12 months did not catch God by accident. God has a purpose for your life and mine in this place. And in this place called Calvary, Jesus comes to face the cross. Jesus is creator. Jesus is creator God. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The idea that all religions point to God, that all religions point to the same God, is absolute blasphemy. The idea that uh, all ways lead and all roads lead to the same place is far, far from truth. This place of salvation, this cross, is the way by which we are saved, and it is the only way ordained of God whereby a sinful man or woman might have their sins redeemed and, and washed away. Buddha and Mary and Gaia and, and Mohammed that are not equal, there will be only one that will go to the cross, will be buried, and will rise again, and his name is Jesus Christ. None of the other gods are an equal part of the triune Godhead. This is ascribed only to Jesus Christ, and the deity of Christ is often attacked. It was attacked in the first century by the Gnostics who claimed that uh, Jesus was uh, not God because he was in the form of man. In the fourth century, Arius said that Jesus could not be co-eternal with God. In the fifth century, Nestorius taught that Jesus was two separate persons, and uh, sometimes he was God, sometimes he was man. In the seventh century, Mohammed said God had no son. In the 19th century, Joseph Smith declared that that Jesus was simply a son of God and a brother of Satan, but not the son of God, the Christ. In the 20th century, modernists, even in some seminaries, questioned the deity of Jesus Christ. In the 21st century, in the name of tolerance and in the idea that all, I, all gods are acceptable, we see some again trying to pull the Lord Jesus Christ down. But I want you to understand that the one who came to this place called Calvary is none other than Christ, the very Son of God. This is who he is, coming to a part of his creation. It was a prepared place, and it was a painful place. This place where the Roman soldiers brought these criminals outside of Jerusalem was known as a place of pain. Notice in verse 33, the Bible says, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. There they crucified him. 
You see, the Word had become flesh. Jesus Christ is now in the form of man. He is still 100% God. He is now 100% man. He is there as the God-man to experience real pain. This was the place of capital punishment. This was a place of crucifixion under the Roman law. Deuteronomy 21, 23 tells us, for he that is hanged is a curse of God. This was a shameful death. This was a painful death. This death would require that Jesus would be stripped naked. This death would require that a very heavy, square, wrought iron nail would be driven through the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through the arch on each of his feet, as they are placed together, nails would come with the knees slightly bent to allow the one being crucified to stretch up for air during the time of the crucifixion. In fact, most of those upon a cross would die of asphyxiation as they were seeking to breathe and as they were suffering the blood loss and the dehydration, struggling somehow to find breath there on the cross of Calvary. The tools that were used were brutal and so very, very painful as they would place the nails through the hands and the feet and the crown of thorns upon the head of Jesus Christ. The common method of ending a crucifixion swiftly was the breaking of the bones of the one that was on the cross of Calvary. This was unnecessary for Christ as he died six hours after his crucifixion. The Bible says in Galatians 3 and verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So Jesus not only is suffering the pain of the cross, but he is suffering the sin of the cross, being made a curse for us. It was real pain that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the perfectly sinless Son of God, experienced for us. He had been tempted in all points like as we are, but he was without sin. He did not deserve the cross, but voluntarily he goes to the cross to become the redemption of for the sin, the covering for the sin of all who would believe. It was a real pain. May I say today, it was a redemptive pain. It was not a wasted pain, but it was purposeful. It was for our sin. It was so that we might be reconciled back to God. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Romans 3, 24, as we consider what happened on this cross judicially, theologically, what happened there for us on our behalf, the Bible says in Romans 3 and 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Every man needs to be justified, for every man is separated from God by his sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only place of justification for sin is found in this place, Calvary, where Jesus shed his blood. We are justified freely by his grace. It was only by grace that he went to the cross of Calvary. But notice verse 25, whom God hath set forth, speaking of Jesus, God the Father hath set forth to be, notice now, a propitiation through faith in his blood. You see, Jesus on the cross of Calvary became our propitiation. You know the meaning of this word. It simply speaks of a covering. It speaks of the mercy seat, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant upon which the blood was sprinkled in the Old Testament. And Jesus became our propitiation, the covering for sin. All of us as sinners need a covering for sin. And I'm going to tell you something. The church can't cover your sin. And the baptistry can't cover your sin. And religion can't cover your sin. Only the blood of Jesus can cover sin. That's why Calvary is so vitally important. This place of Calvary, this cross of Calvary, this sacrifice of Jesus is what makes it possible to know the forgiveness of sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. The place of Calvary. What a place. That Jesus would step into a place of his own creation to provide for our redemption. But notice, secondly, 
not merely the place of the cross. Let's notice the people of the cross. After all, that's why he came. He came for people, people like us, people like these in the scripture. Verse 35, uh, the Bible tells us, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. Now notice this phrase in verse 35, the people stood beholding, interesting phrase, meaning they were spectators. They were there, some were worshipers, but the majority were spectators. This was something to watch. This was something to jeer. This was something to make comment about. You know, we live in a nation full of spectators. We live in a nation where uh, people sometimes are even attracted to grotesque sport. And they bet on these sports and they scream and yell and think that it's kind of cool. And as America becomes more and more depraved, the more bloody and the more ugly, we are becoming more and more, in my opinion, like the Romans of old. Imagine yourself just for a fun afternoon going to watch someone crucified. This gives you a picture of the mindset of the Roman culture, how depraved it had become. And they were there as spectators. And may I say that while they may merely have come to see who was being killed this day, they would be held responsible for what they saw. May I say that every person in America who hears the name of Christ and the gospel of Christ, even if they reject it, even if they only use Jesus for cursing where you work, even if they only make fun of Jesus on television, however they uh, twist the truth, may I remind you that one day it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, every man will stand before God for what he does with the truth of the crucifixion and the resurrection. This world may view themselves merely as spectators, but they will be held responsible. Now Jesus had taught in John 12, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And here we see that he is lifted now upon the cross, and yet we see these scorners. The Bible says in Psalm 22 and verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the heads, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Psalm 22 and 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hand and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Again, every single activity around around the cross was prophesied in the Old Testament. All of this tragedy is according to God's timetable. Please, friend, remember, as we go through this life and as we await for the coming of Jesus Christ, that all of it is according to his timetable. The crowd was just watching as the Son of God was mocked and humiliated and brutalized. And it makes you wonder, what would people do today? What would the response of the average citizen be today? The Bible tells us in Matthew's gospel, they walked by and they, they wagged their heads. They railed on him. They, they said unkind things to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were at least three categories of these people. There were the rulers, the Bible says in verse 35, and the rulers also with him derided him. This no doubt speaks of the Jewish Sanhedrin, some of the religious rulers who were hoping to be done with Jesus Christ, and, and uh, they derided him, that is to sneer or to scoff. They, uh, they showed sarcasm. Well, he said he was the son of God. Well, he's obviously not the son of God. He saved others. He can't, uh, he can't save himself. And this is the mind of the unbeliever today, is it not? It's a mind of sarcasm. It's a mind of criticism. Even while people say, sometimes they say they believe in God, but they'll relegate Jesus to some lower echelon of the gods. Sometimes they'll outright deny that there is a God. 
Some of you remember the comedian and political satirist George Carlin who said uh, before his death, something is wrong here. When there's war and disease and death and destruction and poverty and corruption, something is wrong. This is not good work. If this is the best God can do, I'm not impressed. Results like these do not belong on the resume of a supreme being. The man in his twisted mind failed to understand that the sins and the wars and the sickness of this world are not originated by God, but originated by sinful men themselves. And George Carlin realized that the moment he died in 2008 and he faced a loving God who had sent his son for if by the sins, uh, for if by the, because of the sins of many, one died and one paid the price for our sin, then all may be found whole through Jesus Christ. But he rejected Christ. He turned from Christ. Many choose not to believe. The rulers chose not to believe. There's a second group. There's the soldiers. Notice in verse 36, the Bible says, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. Think of this. Men who were sworn professionals, men who were paid substantially, some of them, by the Roman government. Now they are mocking. Now they're offering vinegar to Jesus Christ instead of water. The Bible speaks of this in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not. Uh, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. You see, by the very wounds, by the very shedding of the blood that those soldiers were watching, healing could have come their way, except for the fact that they rejected him as the Son of God. They also made their choice to ridicule. They mocked him. In fact, in verse 38, the Bible says, they made a superscription and placed it over him. And they made it in Greek on account of the Hellenistic Jews that would have been present. And they made it in Latin on account of the governmental language of the day. And they made it in Hebrew on account of the language uh, that was uh, uh, also common amongst those uh, who were there uh, with the rulers and their followers. And, and, and in order to cover this universal message of satire and criticism, the guards put this inscription there. Years ago, there was a painting made by Rembrandt. Rembrandt, in this painting of the crucifixion, simply placed himself in the picture of the crucifixion. Interestingly, he placed himself as the one overseeing the crucifixion, the one watching the crucifixion. Rembrandt was illustrating in this painting that we were all there, that all of us were there spiritually. Thank God if you're there as a believer, then your sins are being covered by the blood that is atoning. But if you're there as an unbeliever, simply observing, there is no atonement for someone who sees it and wags his head and reviles and only uses Jesus' name in a cursed language. There's no redemption for someone who's like the ruler and like the soldier, just making fun of what's happening there. And Rembrandt reminds us, it's not enough to know that there was a Jesus. Historically, we must know him personally as our Savior if we will be saved, if we will have a home in heaven. We see the rulers and the soldiers. And then, of course, the two thieves. How could you preach about the cross without remembering those two thieves? Notice in verse 39, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. Can you imagine that? You ever, you ever wonder about the depravity of man? Do you ever wonder about it? You ever wonder why so many men in prison, so many men and women strung out on drugs, so many people strung out on their bitterness? I mean, you could name the sin. Why is it that the only time they use the name of God is to curse God's name? Why is it? Some are saved. Thank the Lord for that. But so many people are bent on hating God. And in fact, the farther they turn from God, perhaps giving themselves even to Satan himself. And do you see that here in this malefactor, this common criminal? Who is he to revile the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Yet he does. 
Here we see the first thief as he reviles and speaks out. The word railed on is an interesting word. It's blasphemeo. It speaks of speaking evil or falsely of Jesus Christ, denying who he is. He says, if you are the Christ. But then, of course, there's a second one, is there not? In verse 40, but the other. Would you pray with me that we would find some of those others this week with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Don't let the devil tell you that everybody you work with doesn't want God. Don't let the devil tell you that all 500,000 people in the Antelope Valley are God-hating, COVID-fearing people that don't want to see you or touch you or hear from you. Hey, I'm going to tell you, there are some others. There were two at the cross. One reviled and one believed. And we must remember that there are some who do still want to know the truth of Jesus Christ. And sometimes they wonder why we don't tell them. And here we see this other. The Bible speaks of him here, verse 40. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou, dost, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Oh, listen, this man had a tenderness to Christ. Verse 41, and we indeed justly, he says, We deserve this. We deserve to be hanged. We're criminals. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, listen, this man hath done nothing amiss. By the way, what you believe about Jesus is vitally important if you're going to be saved. It's not just that he's the way to heaven. He is. It's not just that he forgives sin. He does. But you must understand that he is the Son of God, the perfect Son of God. He's not just another man. And this thief was catching that. <laughs> This thief was seeing that Jesus Christ is the sinless one. He is the Son of God. He has done nothing amiss. And he looks in verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. We see a repentant heart when he says, it, it should have been us. We deserve this. Uh, we see that he is willing to admit his sin. We see a believing heart when he says, Lord, remember me. Acts 20 and 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Burkhoff said, moreover, true repentance never exists except in conjunction with faith, while on the other hand, wherever there is true faith, there is also real repentance. In other words, when a man or a woman is saved, when a child is saved, there is this awareness and recognition of their sin. There's a willingness to confess their sin, even as they are turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if someone is not convicted of that sin and seeing their need for Christ, then they will not be saved. And this man was convicted of his sin to to the point that he turns to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me in paradise. And you know what Jesus said. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, thank the Lord for his promise. Thank the Lord that God covered him with grace. This morning we see the place of the cross. It is called Calvary, Cranium, the hill of the skull. We see the people of the cross and some rejecting and some receiving Christ, such as the centurion. But notice, if you would with me this morning, the pardon of the cross. What is being accomplished here is the pardon of the sin of all who would believe. The sinless one took on the face of a sinner so that we sinners could take on the face of a saint. Jesus bears this horrific pain and shedding of blood so that we might have redemption. There is at the cross then pardon for sin. By the way, I don't care if you've been saved three years, 30 years, or 60 years, don't ever get over what happened at the cross. You hear a song about the cross, you say, oh, I've sung that 20 times before. Sing it again and thank God for it the pardon of the cross. Now notice in verse 34, the Bible says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. That's the heart of God for you. That's the heart of Jesus toward you. Father, you know what's about to happen here. You sent me on this mission. Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Now, the question this morning, who can forgive sin? Some say their church can forgive sin. The Mormon church baptizes people for their dead relatives so that their dead relative's sin can be covered. The Church of Christ teaches that sins are washed away in the water when someone is baptized. It's called baptismal regeneration. The question this morning is, does water wash away sin? The question this morning is, can a church wash away sin? Can we, by doing our own good works, wash away sin? And I believe the answer is very clear in the Bible this morning. There is one that can wash away sin, and his name is Jesus Christ. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being saved through him by the wrath to come. Every one of us can find salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. But some would say, well, Jesus, yes, we understand Jesus, but Jesus was just a man. How can you say that just a man could forgive our sin? May I submit to you this morning that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, uh, that he was born uh, of the Virgin Mary. Listen, if he, if he uh, wasn't man, then who was that in Bethlehem? manger, but if he wasn't God, then why did the angels say, unto you this day is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord? If he wasn't man, then who was baptized in the Jordan River? If he wasn't God, then why did a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased? If he wasn't man, then who was that that was tempted in the wilderness? If he wasn't God, of whom did the scripture say he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him? If he wasn't man, to whom did the leper boy bow and say, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And if he wasn't God, who said, I will be thou clean. And if he wasn't man, who touched the brow of Peter's wife's mother. And if he wasn't God, who made the fever leave. And if he wasn't man, who was that asleep in the back of the boat. And if he wasn't God, who was it that looked to the waters and said, peace, be still. And if he wasn't man, then who stayed on the mountain all night to pray. And if he wasn't God, God, who saw the disciples in their storm toss ship and came walking to them on the water. And if he wasn't man, then who rode in the sand at the feet of the woman taken in adultery? And if he wasn't God, then who said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And if he wasn't man, who stopped and said, who touched me? And if he wasn't God, who looked at the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and then touching the hem of his robe has made me whole and said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. And if he wasn't man, who stood all day and taught the multitudes. And if he wasn't God who took the five barley loaves and the two fish and fed a crowd of 5,000 men beside women and children. And if he wasn't man who whipped outside the tomb of Lazarus in Bethany's graveyard. And if he wasn't God who cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And if he wasn't man who washed the disciples' feet. And if he wasn't God who said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. And if he wasn't man who sweat as it were great drops of blood. And if it wasn't God who said, Father if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If he wasn't man whose beard did they pluck out. And if he wasn't God who said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And if he wasn't man who said, I thirst. And if he wasn't God who looked at the thief next to him and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And if he wasn't man who looked down at Mary and said, woman, behold thy son. And John, uh, John, behold thy mother. And if he wasn't God who cried, it is finished. And if he wasn't man, then who on that cross cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if he wasn't God, then who said, Father, into thine hands I commit my spirit. And if he wasn't man, whose body did they place in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea? And if he wasn't God, who rose on the third day triumphantly? He is the God man, and he is the only one who can save someone's sin the only one who can cover sin and provide salvation is this God man. Oh, from the heart of the Father, we hear this love message today that from Calvary, a word is spoken and the word is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. First John 4 and 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. 
Jesus came to that cross. He bore the pain of that cross, the suffering, the separation, the loneliness of that cross so that our sins could be pardoned. It's a place where sins are pardoned, a pardon for sin. But it's also a place for the saved that is provided here. You see, what is, what is provided at the cross? Well, a pardon is provided, but also because of the cross, there's a place where every believer will reside. Did you catch that in verse 43? The Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now the word paradise speaks of the soul's destination immediately after death. And he says, You'll be there immediately. We read the word here. We read it in Luke 16 with Lazarus. Paul speaks of paradise in 2 Corinthians. He says, you're going to be there immediately. You'll be with me in heaven. It speaks of heaven, the place of the saved. Billy Graham tells the story of a time early in his ministry when he arrived in a small town and he saw a young man. He needed some directions and he asked the young man, he said, son, where's the post office? He said, I'm, I'm looking for the post office. And afterwards, the evangelist said, to the young man, I'd like to invite you to come to our revival meeting tonight. I'm going to be preaching a message and telling people how they can know how to get to heaven. And the young boy said, I don't think so. He said, if you don't know how to get to the post office, I'm not going to listen to you on how to get to heaven. <laughs> you know, you, you may not know where the post office is, but if you know Jesus, you know how to get to heaven. Because whoever will come to him, he will in no wise cast them out. And oh, what a blessing to think of this, that as Jesus is on the cross, being reviled by rulers and soldiers and criminals, that this one man said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in heaven. You'll recall, this, this man did not have the opportunity to get baptized. Could somebody help me with that this morning? He didn't have a Sunday school pen to show you. He didn't have a religious pedigree. He simply believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And Jesus said, I'll meet you in heaven. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This same Jesus, who provided a place called heaven for this trespasser, will provide a place called heaven for your neighbor, He'll provide a place called heaven for your friend. Now, he may want to use us to invite them. It may require that we're obedient to his commission to tell them about Jesus Christ. Well, they're not ashamed to tell you about their sports team or their political view. They're, they're not ashamed to tell you about what matters to them. Does Jesus matter to you? When we think of all that he did, should we not tell others of his wonderful love? You see, there's a great difference today, my friends, a great difference between realizing on the cross he was crucified and then saying on the cross he was crucified for me. And when it becomes personal like that, then you know salvation. Then you have a message to share with others. For the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. May I challenge you this week to share that name, to talk to folks. Look at it, it's Easter. Boy, I'm looking forward to church this Sunday. Our pastor's going to preach about the resurrection, the coming of Christ. He's beginning a brand new series talking about what's going on in the world and where does it align biblically and how we can know that God has a plan. In fact, you can receive a free copy of his book, Understanding the Times. I hope you'll come. You'll tell us about Jesus. You'll learn more about the one that means so much to me, more than anyone else I've ever known, Jesus. He died on the cross of Calvary. And even that guy at work that only says Jesus in the form of a cuss word, something's going to come into his mind. 
Some thought's going to come racing into his heart. Maybe a grandmother's praying for him in another state. I do not know. But God can use you to nudge them so that they might know the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross. At the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light. Oh, friend, never get over what happened for you at the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us of the cross when they came to the place which is called Calvary. Let's think of that place. Let's live in that place this week. Let's live out the reality of the cross this week. Shall we stand together? Our Father in heaven, this morning we have taken time to study not every detail of the cross, for there were many sayings that you gave. Not every personality at the cross, there were others. But Lord, we have overviewed not only the place, not only those people, but most of all, we've seen the pardon that you provide from that cross. And we just want to pause as we begin this Easter week, and we want to say thank you. Now, Lord, would you help us as your people to not be ashamed of that cross? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed for just a moment. I wonder how many of you in this room would say, Pastor, it never gets old, this hearing about the cross. Because when I hear about it, I remember how I got saved. If you're saved, would you take a moment to go back to that moment of salvation when you heard about the work of the cross? And if you're saved this morning, how many in this room would say, Pastor Chapel, I am so glad that what happened on the cross has covered my personal sin. I'm so thankful for that. Could you lift your hand this morning if you know that to be true? My sins were covered at the cross. Mine were covered at the cross. God bless you. Praise God. Is there someone here this morning who would say, wow, if my sin can be covered and if I can be reconciled to God, I would like to know more about that. I would like to know what it means to have that wonderful redemption, that relationship that you preached about, I want that. If you're here this morning and you're not 100% sure that heaven is your home, you can know this. The Bible says you can know that you have eternal life. Is there someone here today who'd say, Pastor Chapel, I don't know it. I'll be, I'll be honest enough, humble enough to say, I don't know that I'm heaven bound, nor do I know that my sins are covered. I want to know how the cross can change all of that. Please pray for me. Right now, would you lift your hand up? Just lift it up and say, here's my hand. I don't know that I'm heaven bound, but I want to know it. Lift your hand right up. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. And how many of you believers then who would say, Pastor, I know it. I know I'm heaven bound. How many of you would say, I have a neighbor that likely doesn't know this. I have a friend, Pastor, before next Sunday comes, I'm going to speak to them about Jesus. I'll invite them to church. I'm going to talk about the cross unashamedly. In the next seven days, I'm going to lift up the cross as God leads and God allows. Pastor, pray for me. I'm going to lift up Christ. Would you lift your hand? I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to bless and use you and all of us as a church family. Father, I pray if there's anyone here right now without Jesus in their heart, that they would come and receive the pardon of the cross. And then I pray for those hundreds who raised their hands, Lord, that all of us would be people of the cross this week. Help us to carry these tracts, these gospel invitations. Help us to just look for people to speak to. And Lord, I think of a couple of the visits that we had even yesterday and that Terry and I spoke to a few young ladies, Lord, just friendly and kind and yes, interested and will come. Lord, help us not to be intimidated thinking that nobody wants to hear it. So use us this week to proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look forward to seeing all that you will do as the cross is lifted up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.